Hello, everyone. It is Wednesday, July 12th, 2022, and it is the 87th consecutive hangout of the Knowledge Bolide crew, sponsored by Topher Spin Meteorites. Thanks for joining us. We're really going to offer a lot today. We have a lot of science and history about something that is very rare, and I actually wanted to learn a lot about it too, carbonaceous meteorites. We're going to dissect this over, over a few periods. So today we're only going to be talking about three clans, the CM, the CO, and the CI. That may not mean much to you now, but you will understand that in a few minutes. We have two international um, crew members supplying videos. All of our show and tell today is carbonaceous in those three families or in those three groups. And uh, these are really rare and important meteorites. So we're going to check in with our honorary professor, Pat, to help us understand why they're so rare and what makes them different. But first, we're going to check in with the most beautiful collector of meteorites in the world. Sue, how are you? You got some announcements Thank for Thank you. <laughs> okay, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Topher's wife. Mrs. Topher Spin. I just have a few quick announcements. We are going to be pushing the schedule out um, a few weeks. We're not going to be getting rid of any of these shows that we previously had planned, the um, second and third parts of the Carbonaceous Chondrites and the Irons show, which is a two-part series. We're going to push them out for a few weeks while Topher and um, some of the crew uh, members are down in Tucson. But don't just go away for a few weeks because Topher is going to be doing live events. On, you have to be on um, Facebook to catch these. They're going to be on Facebook Live, not on the Zoom like they normally are. He's probably going to do some on the Wednesday nights, uh, but he might be doing even more than just those two. So just, just keep an eye out. He'll probably give updates as he uh, decides. He probably has to be down there first to see what's going on and where the good um, material and good uh, show will be. The only other thing that I wanted to share for an update after that is just a little bit of a teaser. We are introducing a new segment when Topher comes back from Tucson. And we've already started working on it. And it is going to be something that involves one-on-one uh, -on -one time with each crew member uh, over time. It's going to take a few months. But we will be introducing that segment uh, probably the week after he gets back. Back to you, Topher. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so we're going to jump <clears throat> right into trying to understand carbonaceous chondrites. So we're going to get into the science pretty deep later on a little bit with our with, with Mike Kelly. We're going to ask our, our honorary professor, Pat, to help us explain just a little bit of something. If you were to be, this is the question that, that we're just going to ask the group and have Pat answer for us today. Carbonaceous chondrites are chondrites, but they're different. There are some chondrites that have carbonaceous class. They're on different grading scales and different classification scales. So they're obviously different, but they're both chondrites. So how are they different? How are they the same? What do they have in them? What don't they have in them? Right. And what kind of care and attention do they deserve? So Pat? Right. Okay. Um, so the first part of the 27 parts question is there are different. <laughs> no, uh, carbonaceous chondrites are really very, very fascinating meteorites. They are chondrites in that they have chondrules, usually, except for the ones that don't, like the CIs. Um, they are they're different in that they're not as uh, strong or hard of a rock. They're much more friable. Um, their elemental uh, composition is more of a low temperature thing. There's a lot more volatile elements in them. The um, ordinary chondrites are really pretty rock-like. They're mostly silicate with some metal and such. Uh, but the carbonaceous chondrites have some of those silicates, but they've got carbon compounds. They've got hydrocarbons, uh, alcohols, amino acids, etc. cetera. Uh, and they've got water. And hmm. that water part is really, really important, as we'll see as we spin our way into this. Uh, so carbonaceous chondrites, uh, many of them are are so fragile and friable, they're like a dirt clod. Uh, you could pick up a piece of uh, of some of the, the rarer ones and just 
turn it into dust with your hand. It's like yeah. dirt clod sort of sort of composition. Yeah, please and, don't though. <laughs> yeah, don't. <laughs> well, as soon as you see the prices, you won't be tempted to do that. Uh, we had some really interesting action in uh, in Asia here recently, and and well and Africa as well, where we had a number of carbonaceous chondrite falls that all happened in a fairly short period of time. Mm -hmm. And in general, carbonaceous chondrites are, are rare. They're a small percentage of the total of, uh, of meteorites and even a small percentage of the chondrites. Uh, but we had several fall. We had Tarda, we had the one in Indonesia uh, that I can't pronounce. Uh, and many of those... Um, you know, were so fragile and they fell in wet areas that they had to be collected fairly quickly to avoid losing them. And it's the sort of thing where if it was on a, even on a dirt path and you stepped on it, it's now a mud puddle. Uh, so, so they may actually be a little more common than we think when they're observed falls. Interesting. But uh, they, these are not meteorites that will last thousands of years uh, on the ground. Uh, so, so they contain um, a higher percentage of carbon. Some of the other meteorites have carbon, but but that's how these are named. And this goes back to Gustav Rose, Rose's uh, classification of 1863. Uh, in general, carbonaceous chondrites are oxidized. They have iron in them, but it's in the form of, of oxides or or uh, you know not as, not in the form of metal. Uh, ordinary chondrites have more. Uh, iron as metal in them. Um, the ordinary chondrites for petrological grade go from three to four, five, six, seven, with more time under temperature and pressure. The carbonaceous chondrites go the opposite direction. It still starts at three. That's that's perfect. That's un, un metamorphosed. But when you go to two, you've got some aqueous alteration. And this is the wild part. This is the water tie-in. This is liquid water, which yeah. is rare in space. Yep. So altered by liquid water. Some of the silicates are turned into phytosilicates, which is a $10 word for clay. Uh, and then some of them have a lot of aqueous alteration. They actually go all the way to one. And, and so low temperature, they form further away from the sun. Uh, they're softer. They're friable. And we have tied some of them to asteroids. When we do, when we look at asteroids uh, remotely, um, we can do spectroscopy where we can look at what uh, wavelengths of light reflect off of that body. And we can get a pretty good idea of the composition of the body. So when we did the science on, on, uh, Benu and uh, to Ryugu, thank you. Um, we we pick those out very carefully because they're the, they're these interesting classes of asteroids that have this carbonaceous chondrite sort of material. And the first material we have back from Ryugu, uh, they did a first look at it, and it is surprisingly like CI uh, carbonaceous chondrite material. So it's, it's compressed. It's not as fluffy. A little denser, which you know the way the way you get meteorites meteoroids ejected off of a parent body is by impact. So they crush them; they're a little more dense. So that that's kind of the teaser first part. Hmm. Awesome. And as far I'm sorry, you had, the second the second part of that question was about storage. These things are fragile. Uh, it's generally best to keep them in a desiccant uh, sort of uh, environment, whether it's a full-on pretty, uh, uh, you know, gas-tight uh, box like the plexiglass box we saw a couple of, of uh, shows ago, or if it's just in a bigger cabinet, then you have the, the edges sealed up with a gasket and, and uh, desiccant. They also need to be handled very carefully because of this fragility, this friability. Thank you so much, Pat. I really appreciate that. That was well done and a, a pretty good intro to carbonaceous meteorites. They're, they're pretty scientifically important and we're going to get into a little bit more science. So if you didn't catch all of that, Mike is going to be highlighting some of those points later on as well. <clears throat> Which was a very good one to show how fragile the carbonaceous chondrites are 
where the guy's driveway was just a, a spattering where the uh, carbonaceous chondrite hit hit the end of the driveway. You yep. could and sweep it up with a whisk broom, you know, the yep. particles. Yep. And we're, we're going to check in with, uh, with Chris Monk later on, who has a sample of that. Uh, right now, we're going to check out a, our first international video. This is from Marco Geiser. Hello, guys. Hi from Germany. Today, unfortunately, not live. But um, yeah, of course, I want to show you something. And uh, maybe the one or other has a guess what it could be. You're right, it's an oriented meteorite. Yeah. So have fun, enjoy, and uh, <laughs> let's have a look on the piece. Yeah, here we go, guys. Mm. That's the piece that I want to show today. Whoa. It's wow. an unclassified chondrite, NWA. Um, it weighs about 910 grams, and it shows a wonderful orientation so you can see um, nice flow lines on the front side and also yeah very smooth red maglips wow Look that looks at that. really good wow and uh, the oh, back side yeah. of the stone yeah. shows nice uh, frothy bumpy fusion crust <laughs> and of course those great contraction cracks look at that yeah they those cracks stand out right yeah yeah Yeah, here you can see the front side of the stone with uh, the nice radial flow lines. Wow. I love the lighting too. Yeah, and that's more than just flow lines. There's some very shallow regmaglyphs in there yeah. as well that are quite parallel. And the very smooth regmaglyphs. Yeah, and that's the back side of the stone. And um, if I put it in the shadow, you can see the wonderful contraction cracks. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's beautiful. Alligator skin. And quite thick crust too. Mm -hmm. And of course, oh, yeah. here, mm -hmm. um, the same backside of the stone. Directly in the light, you can see the frothy bubbly fusion crust. <laughs> Look at all the spattering in there too. Yeah, that's the crust good. is quite yeah. fresh. And I think that's, uh, yeah, really a nice Orimet. Wow. That's a beauty. Here on this side, a, cool. a little bit of a roller clip. Ooh. And also contraction cracks. Yep. Wow. Rollover lip up there. Nice. Yeah, here on this side, um, the stone shows, unfortunately, a little bit uh, fracture surface, but also a nice red lip and a quite big chondro. Oh, yeah. Mega chondro. Look at that. It's about five millimeters in diameter. You can't fool me. That's the Milky Way. Yep. Beautiful. Was that an impactor there, or a... no? That's on the wrong side. Okay. This this would be the impact side here. Yes. Okay. Wow. How many? Nine hundred and something grams. Nine hundred and ten grams. Wow. Yeah. It's a, another... Yeah, guys, that was the stone that I wanted to show you today. I hope you will have a fantastic hangout. Enjoy your great time at the hangout. And I hope to see you soon. Goodbye from Germany. See ya. See you, buddy. Bye, guys. Thanks a lot, Marco. Hi, Marco. That's a, that's a beautiful, beautiful stone. I'm glad you have in your collection, man. Now we have the collector from Brussels. Our very own Maxime has an introduction to the groups, the three groups of carbonaceous meteorites, the COs, the CIs, and the CMs. And he's gonna show us some of the type falls as well. So take it away, buddy. Hi everyone, Maxim here. I hope you're all doing good. 
Today I will show you some of my CI, CM and CO meteorites. So I was really happy to know that there are some hangouts about carbonaceous chondrites because this is my favorite class of meteorites. So I am happy because this week, in two weeks and in four weeks, I will be able to show you some of my specimens. So I will prepare videos for uh, each week. So let's start this week with CM, CI and CO meteorites. Enjoy! So, I think that the best way to start this video uh, about the CM, CO and CI meteorites is to show you the three signature meteorites uh, for the classes. So, we have Mige, the signature meteorite for the CM meteorites, Ornens, the signature meteorite for the CO meteorites, so this one is a CO 3.4, and lastly, Ivuna which is the signature meteorite for CI meteorites. But here I would like to show you NWA 6352. So this meteorite is nice because it is the exact twin sister of the Ornance meteorite. It is also a CO 3.4 chondrite. And when looking at it, you can see the typical features of CO meteorites, which are very small and dark chondrules in a dark matrix. This is really interesting to see. Now let's move to the CI meteorites and the only other I have apart from Ivuna is the very very well-known Orgueil. So here is the specimen I had for many years in my collection. So this is some dust from Orgueil really small, the camera won't even focus on it. Mm -hmm. But very recently, I decided to do an upgrade of this uh, mm. lot of dust here and buy this one. <laughs> so uh, maybe you will say that it's not really an upgrade because uh, we remain in the micro domain. <laughs> mm -hmm. But for Orgoy and my budget, this is a huge upgrade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. here, this is what I have currently displayed in my collection. Quite small, but uh, what I like is that uh, I can see it uh, with the naked eye. So that's uh, a big uh, leap forward for my collection. <laughs> Congrats, buddy. So yeah, okay, a very nice one. And I love the CI chondrites even more since we discovered that the asteroid Ryugu uh, is really close in composition to CI chondrites. So it gives them even more scientific value, I would say. Now let's go with my favorite group among my favorite class of meteorites, which is the CM group. So for this one, I have much more to show. And let's start with the classical one here, Murchison. So those are quite small fragments here. Mm -hmm. But if you look closely, you can see some white inclusions, some white controls in there. So that's interesting. I really would like to upgrade it, but I think it won't be for uh, very soon. So after Murchison, let's talk about the new Murchison, which is Aguasarcas. So firstly, I have this little specimen here, which I bought not so long after the fall from Big Kahuna Meteorites. You can see the white inclusions in there. And next to that, I have here a little vial full oh, nice. of crumbs from Aguasarcas. And I particularly mm. love two specimens because they look really great under the microscope. You can see all the white inclusions and chondrules in there. So that's really interesting. Now, I also have this little NWA 11345, which is classic CM2 NWA meteorite. But I really love it because it shows it's a little slice, it shows a beautiful interior. As you can see, we see beautiful chondrules in there. Yeah. And oh. even a little CAI. So that's really beautiful. Then next is a meteorite I was really lucky to obtain from Mark Lyon, uh, not so long after the fall. So this is Koleng, but here are some little mm. specimens. And beside those little micro specimens, I also have this nice little 1.495 grams uh, Kolenk, 
This is a fragment that comes from the Hammer Stone. What is also interesting with Kolang is that it is the first observed fall ever of the CM12 type, which is really nice. And speaking of CM12 meteorites, here are here is another example, NWA8534, which is also a CM12. And I particularly like this uh, little display here because when you look at that, it really makes me think of the samples that were brought back from asteroid Ryugu uh, not so long ago. So I find it really nice. It gives a little touch of a space sample. Yeah. Now next comes Jubilet's Winsel one, a nice little individual I have in my collection that I particularly like because of its cracked fusion crust. Here you can see that it's crackled. You can also see some chondrules. Here you can see the cracks. And then last but not least, one of the specimens I am the most proud of having in my collection. Here is the label. It is NWA 11346. So this is a CM anomalous meteorite. And so it was classified as an anomalous meteorite because it has an anhydrous matrix. So it is not a type 2, it is not a CM2, and it is not a CM1. Nice. This meteorite was really close from becoming the first ever CM3 meteorite. Unfortunately, it was not the case, it was only classified as a CM anomalous. This is a very interesting meteorite, and what is even better about this one is that what I have here is the main mass. Yeah. So you can see that it is uh, an end cut. This is a small main mass, there is a glossy desert varnish here it makes me think of an r chondrite and you can see here some very small chondrules that's really an interesting meteorite that's it for today guys i hope you enjoyed this video and i just wanted to wish you all a great hangout this week but also a happy new year and i wish you all plenty of great new meteorites in 2022 and see you in two weeks for the next hangout about carbon acid chondrite bye awesome Thank you, buddy. <clears throat> Great job on that video. Bad news yeah. is you're going to have to wait a little bit longer to get our carbonaceous stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. You put a lot of time and effort into that video and got some, uh, some really, yeah. really nice stuff. For those on YouTube who may be already gathering the information, we're alluding to the fact of how important and how rare these things are. And now you're seeing samples way smaller than our usual samples that we show here on the, on the Hangout. These things are rare and expensive, and it's quite a luxury to have some of these. So some of the stuff we're going to see today, most of the stuff we're going to see today is on the small side, and it all looks pretty much the same because they're all very related. But a lot of the meteorites have interesting stories and information, and they, they look different on the exterior as well. We're going to kick off a little bit of show and tell right now, and we're going to cut over to Jeff in Canada. He has two meteorites he wants to discuss with us and give us a little background on. So, Jeff, you with us? You betcha. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I can't help you it. Betcha. I'm sorry. All right, Jeff. So, tell us about your first sample, Keynes. Is that right? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, with uh, Keynes, this was uh, an observed fall from uh, 1937 on September 3rd, 1515, uh, near the village of uh, Keynes, Mislomorsky district of Tatarstan, Russia, and it's a C0, a CO 3.2, um, and it took me a little bit of uh, digging to find uh, uh, the original or one of the original news articles to this particular uh, carbonaceous chondrite, uh, so the account here was from the newspaper Izvistia on October 27th, 1937, about the fall, so on September 13th, pieces of a large meteorite fell on a field and in the forest of the Keynes Collective Farm, located on the border of Myslomovorsky and Kalininsky districts of Tateria. Uh, one of them weighing 54 kilograms almost killed a collective farmer working in the field, Melyuda oh. <laughs> Bedriva. The airwave was so strong that Bedriva was four to five meters from the site of the meteorite impact and was knocked off her feet and shell-shocked. So the KGB was actually dispatched um, to uh, basically investigate what had occurred and they had discovered um, four samples uh, that they ended up taking back um, to the uh, USSR Academy of Sciences. 
So it was it's kind of interesting learning wow. about the, the history of this particular one because yeah. I wasn't expecting to find a, a near death experience. Yeah. <laughs> I, not with this particular one, anyways. <laughs> or the KGB involvement. <laughs> well, that too. That too. Wow. Yeah, my dream would be to have a meteorite land that close to me. <laughs> Exactly. It could take out a limb. He, he, he'd sacrifice it. <laughs> <laughs> now, you have another one that you wanted to show uh, or talk about today. Yes, and that's Lance. Oh, I was mispronouncing all this time. Lance. <laughs> wow. It's French. <laughs> yeah, so this, is, <laughs> this is the 47 uh, kilogram uh, main mass that's held at the Vienna Natural History Museum. And it was an observed fall from uh, 1872. And it's a CO 3.5 uh, carbonaceous chondrite. And I had to really do some digging on this one to find more first-handish account. And it comes from the report of the 43rd meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science of uh, September 1873. And the original write-up on this was, um, basically three three different uh, meteorites here at the same time but or roughly around the same time where they kind of grouped them all together but um, it, it was Lance uh, Pont Luzuel Le uh, of France of 1872 July the 23rd uh, the account is a brilliant meteorite passed over a spectator station between Champagny and Brise towards northeast in the direction of Tours uh, it presented the appearance of a spear of flame with two spheres of fire of an orange color the track mm. of one seemed to incline downwards that of the other to proceed straight forwards the whole appearance becoming somewhat more luminous at the intent that a slight divergence of the course of these two spheres was first seen. It was lost at sight behind a cloud at St. Mar, uh, and, and an explosion was heard on the fifth hour of 26th minute. Many observers affirm that they heard two distinct explosions very near together. Others noticed but one, all testified to the appearance of two meteors uh, pursuing nearly the same path. A meteorite fell in the field near Lancé, uh, Couchon of Saint uh, Arnaud and passed by a, a meter and a half through the light soil into a bed of marl. Uh, it weighed 47 kilograms or 104 pounds. Uh, some fragments separated by the fall were found near it. So that was the, the original account. So um, that is cool. Another cool, uh, another cool carbonaceous. Yeah. And I really appreciate you uh, taking on those, uh, those Frenchy names. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying. It's, it's been a while since I've spoken more French. I'm, I'm, I'm brushing up on it. So right. Right. <laughs> I haven't had enough wine. I totally appreciate you, you putting forward the, the effort and the energy and, and putting yourself out there for that presentation. I, I love it, man. Really, really well done. I appreciate it. No worries. I, I, what I really enjoy is the fact that uh, digging in more into the history and trying to find original articles and learning more of the backstory on them. So it's, mm -hmm. it's cool. Well, I thought it was really neat, the description of the bolide event, and it played out in the artwork because you can literally see a, a light uh, beam going forward. So yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So let's, let's see how Chris Monk is doing today. So, hey, Chris. <laughs> hey, buddy. How are you, man? Good. How are you guys? Fantastic. So I've showed this before, but I took it out of the case today and I'm going to very carefully try to show it because it's so small. But we've been talking about the, the CM um, type meteorites and the importance to science. So I'm going to leave most of this science to smarter people than me, um, like Pat and Mike. But this one is really special to me. Um, this is Wenchcomb. This yeah, is a really is. small 0 0.064 gram. And I have showed this before, but the reason that this one is important, it fell on February 28th and 21. Now we talked about how uh, meteorites are altered, um, some of the carbonaceous by water. Um, this is one of those, CM2 is its classification. Not super rare. So, I mean, in the Met Bowl, they list 606 different CM2s. And out of those, 20 of them are falls. But when we talk about the importance to science, one of the unique things about this one that fell on the Wilcock driveway um, on that date is 319 grams were collected, but they were collected within the first 12 hours after it fell. That's important because mm -hmm. it hasn't had any chance to terrestrialize. It hasn't had any chance to be altered by rain, to be 
altered by any other, you know, terrestrial elements. So this one, you know, it hasn't been studied as much as some of the ones like Merchantson or, or even Aguazarcus, but mm -hmm. it, it will, it will over time. And I'm sure that they will find a lot of the same things with the amino acids and, you know, Murchison has over a hundred amino acids in it, but those things are going to be super important to science. Those are the building blocks of life. And, mm -hmm. you know, this stuff formed before the earth and our sun. So yeah. it's, it's just really important. And one of my favorites. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. And you should be ultra proud of it too, because, and you can really see how beautiful this piece is. First off, you can see it. <laughs> so <laughs> I have, I have one that I want to show off, but I'm not going to go as deep into the history and science of it. I just think they're beautiful and I want to show them off. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, um, <laughs> we've been talking about Aquazarchus, uh, and how important it was, but I, these actually, this one actually presents really well so it's a bigger bigger size sample man yeah. that crust is that's burnt marshmallow perfection <laughs> wow. it, and what's nice about it is you can it's actually large enough so you can see yes wow and the, just the makeup of it now as we were talking about this is really really fragile much like pat said i can crumble this in my fingers if i wanted to so it's very rare that you see one of these. This is a slice of Aquazarchus. Wow. You're looking at 9.3 grams. Yes. And it has a side of, let me put it in here carefully. It does have a side of crust. Nice thick slice. Yeah, I think you can only do thick slices if you're bold enough to cut the stuff in the first place. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. So this is probably the largest slice of Aquazarchus that is easy to obtain. But sure. I, yeah, I haven't seen very many slices of Aquazarchus just because of its expense and its uh, fragile nature. We had a question. Um, I'm going to put Pat on the spot here and maybe Mike. Um, in my sample of Aquazarchus, there was a reddish brown inclusion looking thing that looked altered. I uh, wanted to see if Pat or Mike had anything to say about that. I'm guessing that it's a chondral, uh, but that is a guess uh, because when I look at my slice, which is nowhere near as. Uh, spectacular as the toper slice you do see a couple of little brown chondrules in it mm -hmm. now you can see the those two brown blobs in there and actually now that we got this under the under the uh, microscope i think what we're seeing there don't look a lot like chondrules but they've got some armoring around them so i don't know <laughs> they're this cool just, <laughs> this jumped in you, you stumped the professor um, well, Cliff, I think Cliff was wondering if there was a rain spot, possibly. I mean, since they did land in like Costa Rica. <laughs> on your on your so far, I was wondering if it was you know a raindrop or something had hit it. But uh, since Pat's exposed a slice there, it didn't hit the slice, so there's yeah. something interesting going on. Yeah, I'm not not exactly sure. Yeah, I just I just play an expert on TV. We are going to dig into a little bit of science now with our resident geologist Mike Kelly. Um, Mike is going to help us understand uh, the, th the three families or th the three groups of uh, meteorites we're discussing today. But as always, I want to just throw up this, this chart because this is what we are looking at right now. This one part down here is all carbonaceous and we're dividing it into those three just for an introductory bite. Good evening, everybody. Um, so real quick, uh, we were talking clans and we were talking groups. So I wanted to put this up. Uh, we talk about groups a lot. Um, so we are talking CI and then CO and CM. Um, but the interesting thing is above the group level, there's what they call the clan level. And what that kind of means is that uh, you're looking at meteorites that either come from the same parent body or at least from the same kind of reservoir within the solar nebula. So they, they formed next to each other, basically. So this, this diagram really points out to a, a good degree, uh, you know, that the COs and the CMs are related to each other. Uh, so there'd be a COCM clan, and then at the group level, they'd be separated out. 
whereas the CIs, they're their own thing all by themselves. Uh, mm -hmm. Looking at the solar nebula, they, uh, they formed in their own little region. This is a modification slide. Uh, this came out of a uh, uh, snail from 2014, but you'll see this updated when we get into the other parts of the carbonaceous. And I wanted to do an update versus just find a clean chart to show you kind of where things have come, uh, even just since 2014. So all those red blocks that I added in there, mm -hmm. those weren't around uh, that he was documenting around 2014. Wow. So you could see that the, the groups... Go, you know, we Mike? still looking at things. Mike? CR1s, we found CM1. We pushed on the high side. Mm -hmm. So, so past kind of carbonations are really cool because they're really the only things that go into that aqueous alteration down low grades three through seven on the carbonaceous chondrites. And the other kind of cool thing on there was, was Pat mentioned the temperatures. So across the bottom of the scale, it's telling you in Celsius, you know, the kind of degrees to which they formed as far as how hot they got to a maximum extent uh, when they formed. It's interesting to see here the added classifications in the carbonaceous. There's uh, the majority of them there, really. So it must be an ever-evolving uh, science. We're learning a lot. Yeah, sure. as, as they find new things and they find different degrees of alteration, um, yeah, they're, they're separate. CIs uh, were named after Avuna, uh, which fell back in 1980, uh, 1938, sorry, in Tanzania. And the kind of interesting point about Avuna was um, three pieces were, were witnessed to fall. One piece was recovered. Um, you're only looking at a, a massive uh, 704 grams of, wow. of the type specimen was recovered. Uh, it was recovered out of a tree. Oh, jeez. The next day. So wow. it, didn't, uh, it didn't sit on the ground at yeah. all. <laughs> hmm. but, uh, that may be um, where the other two went to. Yeah. And then uh, we'll, we'll talk about Wick in a little bit, but uh, he was kind of the major guy who did the analysis uh, work as far as what the chemistry was inside of it. Um, the other interesting thing about Avuna is, whereas usually, you know, the, the first meteorite of its type creates the group, uh, Avuna is actually the last of the somewhat decent-sized CIs that were found. Alias and Oguay are both older than uh, uh, Avuna by a lot. Uh, hmm. So they just kind of sat around in, in collections, uh, you know, in a, in a null status as far as what their real classification was. Pat had already mentioned, you know, there's the phyllosilicates in there. Uh, he boiled it down pretty well. Um, basically, what that is, is it's all clay material. Um, some of the other neat things inside of there are they do have a lot of magnetite in there. So, again, you get magnetite when you get a lot of uh, aqueous alteration of, of irons. Um, so that'll form you those magnetites. Uh, and as was mentioned, too, it's kind of neat because the sample returns from Bennu also had that high magnetite content in them. So that's kind oh, of a link to potentially being a similar material to CIs. And the final bullet I got on here are they are a cultivation nightmare. Uh, as just been pointed out already, you know, it's a lot of small crumbs. But even when you look at like the main mass over in the, I believe it's the British Museum, uh, which has been under nitrogen storage for a long time and uh, allegedly was under nitrogen storage even before the British Museum picked up uh, that main mass. It's got a lot of weird little cruddy white things growing on the outside of it, which are... Mm. Uh, uh, carbonates and uh, some sulfates and other things uh, because again it's it's got a high affinity to soaking up water uh, in those clays and thus terrestrialization even incuration is a problem and the cool part is they're using those to kind of figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to keep uh, those asteroid return samples from carbonaceous uh, type asteroids c-type asteroids uh, so these are kind of the the test bed samples to uh, to set the protocols that's super cool. Yeah. I threw the, uh, the COs and the CMs on one side together because, again, they are a, a clan. Um, so the COs were named after Arnans, uh, which fell in 1868 uh, in France. Uh, and, again, this was a, a small fall. You're talking a single piece. Uh, it was much larger than Avuna at six kilograms. But there's not a whole lot of it around that you see in collections. You see these tiny little micros uh, because there wasn't a lot to start with. And Daubery was the, uh, the first gentleman who described it uh, the same year it fell. And uh, he's one of those big hitting names because if you get into mineralogy, he has Dauberite named after him. So to have your own mineral means you were, uh, you were doing mm. something right. Yeah. And then the definition, so kind of the break between the two of them, if you look at the, uh, the COs, they have chondrules that are really tiny, uh, less than or equal to 0.2 millimeters. And to break those off from the Mickey types, which uh, was named after Mickey, which fell in 1889, uh, which was the biggest of the three we're talking about today, 18 kilograms, uh, again, single stone.
Oh, wow. Uh, the differentiating, differentiating factor is really small. So you're looking at 3.3 millimeter chondrules versus 0.2 millimeter chondrules for chondral count size. And then you're looking at a difference in the amount of matrix. So the CO oh. is about 50% matrix. The CMs are a little more matrix rich, about 70% matrix. Wow, they are extremely similar. Then you're looking for finite differences. Yes, you're looking at really finite differences. And that's why you get some ones that like will be classed by one, you know, as one type and classed by another person as another type because they are very hard wow. to look and tell apart. And the CMs do break down to subtypes. So there's a 3.0 through a 3.8 as far as, as taking it deeper than like the CIs or the CMs, which are just mm -hmm. ones and twos or, uh, you know, like that. So yeah, that was uh, that was kind of the uh, the same thing. Uh, so what what kind of tells us that those COs and CMs are are similar? Um, again, they got the same kind of small chondrules. Uh, they have the same mineral breakdown as far as what you find in them. They're refractory uh, and lithophile elements. So that's what forms kind of CAIs and what forms uh, litho or stone based material like your olivines and stuff. Uh, they have the same abundances and their O isogen. Uh, ranges uh, on the triple plot are in the same zone. So that's how you know they're together. Sweet. Yep. Uh, just real quick numbers. I'm not going to cover everything. Uh, they are rare. And again, part of the reason why they're rare is they don't last long on the ground. You, you get these highly aqueous altered things. They fall apart real quick. So uh, the CIs, there's only nine total. Five of them are falls. Four of them are from Antarctica. So uh, again, you either see it fall or they pick it up <coughs> off the ice. <coughs> The COs, there are a lot of them. Almost none of them are broken down into subtypes. You can see that just 795 of them are just regular plain old CO3, and that's all we know about them. And there are seven falls there. Uh, and the CM group, uh, there are a lot of CMs, uh, but there are only uh, 21 falls and 21 that get down to that low petrology of CM1, which makes those ones rare. Yeah. Okay, uh, so yeah, fun science. So Pat mentioned Rose. Uh, Rose did have uh, a thing in his original classification scheme uh, for the carbonaceous. Uh, he called them Kalinge type meteorites. Uh, and Tishermack uh, tried to modify it. And so did uh, Brezanine, who both, you know, tried to take his classification scheme and make it better. But Wick went a totally different direction with them in uh, 1856. And he's kind of the basis of where our car carbonaceous chondrite breakdown uh, comes from. And he looked at the water content and the, uh, the free carbon content in them. So you could thank him at a much later date for uh, giving us the, the carbonaceous chondrite breakdown, kind of how we see it. And for um, once, Rose things, the, was wrong. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> it's just uh, a lot of people look at him in different ways, you know. Uh, and the way he looked at him wasn't the way it, uh, we, we agree nowadays is, is the best way to look at him. Cool. Uh, the CIs are cool um, because they are the closest thing we have in meteorites that match the solar photosphere. So that would be, you know, the composition of what started out, you know, prior to uh, balling up and forming the sun. Um, so you'll see a lot of analysis that uh, compares everything to the CIs. Uh, and that kind of tells us what we know a lot about the sun. The other cool thing about the CIs and the CMs are they have the highest abundance of pre-solar grains. So that's little bits of material that got incorporated that were floating around before we had a sun uh, and, and the solar system kind of going. So those, those pre-solar grains are in high abundance in these ones. So they're, they're good for study. Uh, we covered the clays a lot already, so I won't touch on that too much. Uh, another neat thing is the CIs and CMs. If you look at the ratio of uh, deuterium and hydrogen, regular hydrogen and water on Earth, mm -hmm it actually matches up really well with CIs and CMs as far as the water content in those meteorites. Uh, so there's some, some theories out there that uh, they were a major contributor to uh, adding water content as the, uh, the earth formed. Kind of the, the final thing to touch on, because uh, it was touched on that there are a lot of hydrocarbons and, and poly uh, uh, acrylic aromatic hydrocarbons already in there. Uh, so there's a lot of earth and life or abiotic organic compounds in there. So that was touched on already. So uh, the, the last kind of thing is that these things formed way out in the solar system. Um, so they were looked at and, uh, you know, they're thinking that they formed out uh, past like four AUs or distance between the earth uh, and the sun. Um, so they formed out there where it was uh, cold and dark and icy. So that's how they were able to maintain a water content. And at some point they warmed and you got aqueous alteration as that water uh, warmed. I, I thought it was really interesting right here. 17 to 22% water by weight. That's, yeah. So no doubt there's clays and stuff. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. 
Yeah, no, no, no problem. That's and that's it's great you pointed that out because that's actually higher than some of the the studies that they did on some comics. Hmm. So these things have more water content in them than some of the comments out there. That's um, neat, man. And then again, you know, I just threw this list together on uh, some of the cool ones we've uh, seen most of these uh, today in the show and tell. But uh, Alias is also available, uh, and a rare one would be, uh, I would consider would be Mopa Valley because again, it's one of it's one of four CM ones that are available that aren't from antarctica everything else in the cm ones is is in antarctic uh and there are uh four uh three other uh nwes thank you very much mike again yeah, that's that's a lot of information to ask you to die to put into like 15 minutes i super appreciate it man you do a great job every single week we are going to go right back to mike kelly uh now he gets to show do the fun stuff at least he gets to show something off to us yeah, like so what you I'm, got, gonna, buddy. I'm gonna pop out a couple that already got seen to preserve everyone's time. So I wanted to show off a couple ones that we haven't seen. Uh, so I talked about CM ones only being four available. Uh, so this is one of those four, and this is from uh, NWA. This is NWA one two three two eight, uh, and this is CM two, and it's just like all the other CM twos we saw. Uh, you know, this is 0.14 grams total. Um, but it's a whole bunch of little fragments. Uh, and like mentioned, it, you know, it really reminds me of those uh, return samples. That's kind of mm -hmm. cool to it. Uh, we talked about Avuna, and I shot you a couple of photos. Hopefully you can squeeze them into the YouTube part of it. Uh, that's my sample of Avuna. And uh, the, the photos that I shot over were under the microscope. And you can oh, really sweet. see all those little uh, carbonate and uh, sulfate uh, gremlins growing yeah. on them in there. Hmm. So, although they look like uh, interesting little uh, black fragments in here, they're actually uh, very much so growing a lot of that uh, that that uh, terrestrialization going on. Uh, and again, is there's almost no stopping it with how much this stuff loves water. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to touch on them all, but I did mention that the the C uh, O types you can go ahead and subtype sample them. Um, so that's uh, that's the full set of the subtype samples there. Um, not, not covering them all. Uh, there are some cool names in there. If you want to go get, uh, historics, uh, just a couple of the highlights were Lancet. Yeah. Uh, you get like American Falls, like, uh, Warrington. Uh, that's a cool subtype. You got, uh, 3.8, uh, Isna, which is from, uh, uh, Egypt. So uh, you can do the subtypes and you could do them with some cool falls. And then the last thing I wanted to show uh, that's kind of the holy grails if you're going after the uh, the CO3 subtypes. Oh uh, that's gosh. the one of one, one and only NWA 10119, uh, which is a CO melt britcher. Wow. <laughs> I didn't even know there was such a thing, man. Yeah, and it's not uh, it's not a whole lot of TKW there to go around. Either, yeah, so. I would imagine so. Well, that That's is so cool. Keep an eye out for. That yeah. looks like a big piece that if there's not a lot to go around. Uh, yeah, than, that, I was very happy to get, get that that size. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Very happy to get that size. That's awesome. Uh, it's still a micro. It's 0.223 grams. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. You you can't do much with with when you're when you're a collector uh, of and you absolutely need that one to fill a, a, a void in your list. It's like, man, you just <laughs> make it rain. Yeah. If if it was a milligram, I would have got it. If it was a gram, I would have figured out how to make it work. Next week is going to be the nineteenth of January, and we are going to have a little bit of a hangout, but we're going to change it up. It's going to be a quick hangout. Because I have to, I have to pack up and get out of here within hours for for Tucson. So, I'm not going to have any time to really edit or put something out there. So, rather than doing a bunch of show and tell, I figured we're just going to move it to a conversation. So, as a bolide crew, we're going to get together and just discuss and have a conversation mainly about Hello. Tucson, <laughs> <laughs> about Tucson, and about rock shows, about maybe Quartzsite, some rock shows that you've been to experiences you've had are you planning on the tucson what is your favorite purchase you've made in tucson um for those who are not experienced in a tucson show what should you expect 
should I not bring anything but credit cards or I should bring <laughs> pockets of cash? Um, what That's other things do I need to bring with me to make my shopping experience and my hunting experience more successful? So that's going to be what we're talking about next week, kind of a, an open conversation with a bunch of the crew members. And a lot of us are, are going to be meeting in Tucson within a week and then going on from there for several weeks. Is there anybody shopping for people who are not going to make it to Tucson? I do offer personal shopping services. So yeah. if you're looking for something in particular, make sure you connect with me um, offline and I'll put you in my little, my little moon diary. Okay. So, yeah. It's the little black book. <laughs> All right. Our last round of show and tell is with Pat. Pat, what do you have, man? Well, so got uh, Murchison, the mighty Murchison. This is a, uh, a 1.3 gram slice of Murchison that nicely shows the uh, little tiny chondrules and uh, uh, lots and lots of matrix. Murchison is a really special one and a, and a very, very highly studied uh, meteorite. So uh, long about 1969, um, we were getting along in the moon program and we built the Lunar Receiving Laboratory in Houston. The Lunar Receiving Laboratory had, you know, they were there to study the moon rocks, but there were no moon rocks yet. So they had the best and the brightest. They had, from every university around the U.S., they had the very best equipment money could buy or build or gin up and buy, but they didn't have any moon rocks yet. So a little meteorite fell in a place called Allende de la Pueblito in Mexico in February of 1969. They got going on studying that. Then they finally got their moon rocks in late July in uh, 1969. But in September of 1969, this meteorite fell in Australia. Turned out to be a major, major deal. This material was super rare before this fall. And this fall was 100 kilograms. Uh, wow. So definitely brought a lot of this yeah. material to science. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you go to, I was just in the Field Museum recently, and they've got two masses of Murchison that are bigger than a kilogram, about softball sized. Wow. Um, yeah. So this, this fragment mm -hmm. here is, uh, is about 2.8 grams and the slice about 1.3 grams. That slice is beautiful, man. It is quite a, quite a beautiful thing. So then we were also talking about Tarda. And Tarda is a cool one, and Tarda is a weird one. It is a C2 ungrouped. So when, when we discover a new meteorite, and this one was a fall that happened in uh, Morocco, uh, and if it doesn't really fit in with other things, it get, gets called ungrouped. So it has some things like the CMs, but uh, not entirely. So this one is, is a little oriented individual. That's the back side of it. All right, I'm oh, sorry, that's the front side. As we rotate around here. Oh my gosh. Back side. And this one, this one exhibits a couple of pretty cool things. So there's, um, here's the rollover lip. That is amazing. That's that's a complete individual, isn't it? It is a, a complete oriented individual wow. uh, that, that didn't get rained on. And that actually, it's, it's hard to see here, but uh, you can see kind of at uh, 10 o'clock, uh, there's a bit of a brownish coloration there. That is actually brown on the surface of the meteorite when you look at it with the naked eye. And we talked about this uh, when we had uh, the, the B612 project people on, uh, that uh, this is probably oxidation while the thing was transiting the atmosphere uh, with the oxygen split into individual uh, molecules. So it's, it's a super cool kind of rust. Mm. And Turda was really special in that it broke up, um, it disrupted a couple of times and generated some very small individuals. These oh, two here <laughs> are completely yeah. oriented. Yeah. Little tiny. Rusted. Yeah. Wow. 
Ooh. And that, guy, that guy's got a little, little divot in him, and you can actually see a little bit of the inside. Wow. These, these completely crusted little individuals uh, are, uh, are absolutely beautiful, and they're a wonderful purchase because you can get super rare classification, you can get an oriented individual, and you can see all the orientation things for not a terribly large amount of money. Yeah. I purchased some of these from Topper that are in box 906. Uh, <laughs> and I haven't found box 906 yet. Uh, but I have a few more of these uh, that I was able to, to score from Topper that are mm -hmm. just beautiful little meteorites. Uh, the, <laughs> that brown, the, the camera you have right now, really yeah. shows the brown crust off. It does, yes. That lighting. It, yeah. Yes, it does from about... Uh, nine o'clock up to midnight and then also yeah. the lower right, lower rights kind of from two o'clock to five okay. absolutely mm -hmm. man that's that's phenomenal and yeah a super super interesting meteorite because you like you said you can have a lot of character in one small little little stone yes mm -hmm. i got one final one here this one is unclassified so we can't boldly proclaim that it's something it is co like but We've done some XRF work, and it's not very CO3-like. So, unfortunately, this is a fairly small stone. It's only uh, 18 grams or so. But I may actually submit this for classification. Subility suggested by the XRF work is CO2. Hmm. And if you go to the Met Bowl and look, you won't find anything called CO2. So oh. that um, would be awesome. Yeah. You have, our, you have our interest. <laughs> thank, wow. That's what I had. Super. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us live and joining us on YouTube. I'm out of here. We're out of here. Going to the chillax room. See you guys. Bye.